Hey, welcome to Scorpio season. Um, I'm Lisa, and today I'm here with my guest, Venkat. And I'm Venkat, and I'm here with my guest, Lisa, today. Uh, cool, Venkat. So, uh, what are we going to talk about today on Scorpio season? Why don't we start with how we first started chatting on Twitter? Okay. So, yeah. uh, do you remember what it was you first messaged me about? Uh, I like that you remember that I was the one who messaged you first. That's definitely, <laughs> <laughs> definitely true. Um, I actually, I don't remember at all what I first messaged you about. I think I, yeah, I don't remember. I remember David Deutsch being one of the first topics of quantum conversation, something about like quantum mechanics and stuff. And, uh, uh, yeah, I don't remember what we were talking about, but pretty early on, I think we both shared that we are both Scorpios, right? And yeah. we both sort of agreed that that's the best star sign. Oh, I mean, it's definitely the best star sign. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's the only one on this show, you know, Scorpio season. Like, uh, when does Scorpio season run from, Venkat? Like, do you know? Well, of course, it runs from November to November, right? <laughs> yeah. So, <that's> uh, <laughs> It is kind of funny. There are not actually many calendars that uh, run November to November. Like um, there are religious calendars in India that run from Diwali to Diwali. So Diwali is usually in October or November. Mm. So that's one kind of Scorpio calendar. I was actually born on Diwali. So oh, that's exciting. Diwali, baby. Yeah. Uh... So that's Scorpio season. It's the whole year, except it starts with us and ends with us, the Alpha and Omega. Yep, which is, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we are both Scorpios, huh? Um, so what's your opinion of astrology? I take it probably a lot more seriously than I should. Um, rationally, I know that astrology is mostly made up. But I have a lot of trouble... Um, not taking it seriously, if that makes sense. Because <laughs> uh, I read, I mean, the reason that I take it seriously is that, well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is you read the description about yourself and you're like, oh, yeah, that like kind of checks out. I'm definitely like, what are all the things they say about Scorpios? Intense. I'm definitely an intense person. And um, I definitely get jealous. I'm a very jealous person. Um, yeah, I don't know. What, so what, what makes you like, what makes you think that, uh, what, I'm sorry, what are your opinions on astrology, Venkat? So of course, I'm a totally unironic, uncritical believer in astrology. And uh, the profile actually doesn't apply to me as well. Um, I think I used to be a lot more intense, uh, but I've definitely never been a very jealous kind of person. But uh, there is the sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, stereotype of arrogant uh, attitudes. I think that's Scorpio, so that's definitely me. And there is, uh, uh, it's funny, like um, the right way to do superstitions is like almost the exact opposite of the scientific method, right? In the scientific method, when you have a belief, you go out and try to falsify it. In the superstitious method, when you have a belief, you go out and try to confirm it, right? So right. Uh, I'd like to pick out the parts of the Scorpio profile that fit for me. So. Yeah, I think um, a lot of it used to apply a lot more when I was younger than I than it applies now. Like again, ambition I think is a Scorpio trait, but I used to be ambitious, kind of much more laid back now. Yeah. Uh, what about the other systems? Um, which ones do you like? Myers Briggs, Chinese Zodiac. I like okay, so Myers Briggs I think is complete crock. Um, I have a friend. What's your Myers Briggs profile? I am, so this is, I, it goes back and forth every time I take the test. Um, the constant is the middle two, the NT. Um, I have a really good friend here in town who is incredibly into Myers-Briggs and organizes her world and view of people around what their Myers-Briggs sign is. Um, she says that I am definitely an INTP, which is a, inter uh, not interior, a, um, yeah. but introverted, introverted intuitive thinking, thinking perceiving. So uh, I think I take uh, myers Briggs uh, more seriously and less seriously than astrology. But yeah, I'm also INTP, but uh, of course the test is totally gameable. And a uh, couple of times I've drifted across the border to INTJ and uh, ENTP once. Yeah, but, so I, um, think, yeah. I, I think if I don't try 
try to game the test, I usually land on INTP. What about Chinese Zodiac? I'm 1974, so I'm a year of the tiger. Okay, I am 1987, so I believe I'm year of the hare. Um, okay. I feel like a friend of mine recently sent me the, like, here's how you look up exactly what your hour and month and day signs are on the Chinese Zodiac, and it it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I tried to get into it. Like I tried, I tried really hard to like figure out how I could like understand myself through Chinese horoscope astrology and kind of feel like I failed really hardcore. So um, yeah, mostly kind of stick to the Scorpio one. Though I'm really into like, you can get even further. I don't know how far into the astrology like you get, but you look up exactly the time and day of like, like place that you were, um, born and it tells you like all these other aspects of your star signs um yeah. so you know like i haven't personally but uh, yeah astrology is really big in india and i think i'm the same sign in the indian astrological system they take it a lot more seriously there for all life decisions and stuff but i, I remember growing up um, there were books by i think linda goodman linda goodman's sun signs moon signs uh, that was kind of really popular with the teenagers in school and everybody at some point got deeply into it. And then there was the palmistry as well. So for, I think people go through that phase where everybody's reading each other's palms or reading each other's profiles. Um, what yeah. else is there? There's, Actually, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. You're reminding me of like when I was in high school, senior year, I was in like, so part of the get into college game in the United States is that you try and get in, like have as many extracurricular clubs and <laughs> and whatever on your resume. And so like, I didn't, I wasn't like super into this game. I ended up going to state school, so it like kind of didn't really matter. But um, a lot of my friends were in like these after school clubs. So I'd kind of just go join them because why not? And one of the clubs we were in, there were like six of us in this, club i can't remember what the club was called um we had a booth for the like f like the end of year s like spring fair that they would always do kind of in may and we made mm -hmm. a palm reading card like a, a <laughs> psychic tent so someone had like a crystal ball one of my friends was reading palms and then i had the like a stack of cards that I was like, like just normal playing cards. They weren't even tarot cards. I didn't know anything about tarot. <laughs> um, and I like went through and took out all the ones that I couldn't make up a good story for. So it was a lot of like hearts. It'd be like, you know, I like draw, I'd like put out like three cards and then tell you a story about the three cards. And it was like one of them was a heart. So I'd be like, oh, you're going to have like six loves in your life. Um, <laughs> It was really like high school kids. Our tent was super popular. We made a shit ton of money like for this like little club that I don't know what we did. Um, and it was super fun. Yeah. And you listed that on your college application? I mean, I definitely listed the club. I don't, I didn't list like card reader. No. <laughs> Maybe I should uh, do next time I apply to college. I'm definitely going to put that on there. Um. <laughs> I don't think I did any activities of that kind in our school fair. I, I, at one point, we ran a noodle tent, a ramen noodle tent. We were just making instant ramen. And another time, we had like um, a coconut shy, the, you know, throwing balls at coconuts. So, <laughs> but uh, astrology would have been good, though. I think my school would not have, have uh, approved of an astrology tent. Yeah, I don't know what we told you. Yeah, let's see, what else? Let's finish in. We were doing, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah. But it certainly makes a lot of money. It's like, um, yeah, if you want to make money, astrology, you can predict will make you a lot of money. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I wanted to like finish an inventory of um, other things. What are your other, uh, like, um, what's the one? Enneagrams, right? Oh, I like Enneagrams right. too. I think I'm a number five on that. What does a number five mean? Like, do you remember? I don't know. That's one of the weaknesses of the Enneagram. You kind of have to go back each time and refer to the page, but it's, uh, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to try and uh, wing it. I'd have to look it up again, but it, it felt like it applied. Uh, but, but one of the, if, if we were to be scientific about um, these kinds of things, of course, what you do is mix up the profiles without labeling them and tell people to pick out the one that they think fits them the best and then reveal, Oh, you actually picked the Leo. So you're not a Scorpio after all. But, right. um, I mean, what, where's the fun in that? The, the trick is to, I think, triangulate what you think you want to be by looking at like six of these things and then picking the pieces that you like the best 
and then compose it, <laughs> right? Yeah, or like, you know, you just keep looking up more star alignments in your chart until you find the one that you think fits you because there's a lot of options, you know, like where was Jupiter? And what house was like Saturn? Um, yeah, I think like one of my favorite questions with astrology is for people that are into it is to ask them what that means about them. Like, oh, so you're like a Leo. What does that mean? Because uh, I think you're right. You do get like a different answer from each person, right? Like, Yeah. And uh, I think uh, just to take it seriously for a minute, the way it works is if you have like enough of a sufficiently random pile of information with like a lot of leeway in what you pick and choose. Uh, so like, you know, Scorpio might have like a default interpretation, but if that doesn't fit, you can always say, oh, but in that particular year, Jupiter was in the house of Mars or whatever the crap goes on. And you can always find a little epicycle to fit whatever the hell you want to fit, right? So it's like uh, systematic overfitting of uh, your own projections. So I, I think of it almost like, whether it's tea leaves or astrology or whatever it is, you kind of just want um, a random input in which you can kind of do some apophenia, right? Pattern recognition. Yeah. So astrology, I think, is um, one of the best ones. I think I tweeted this at some point that astrology is better than um, all the other systems because it's the most completely uh, random, right? Like Myers-Briggs, the reason I think it's not as good as astrology is that Myers-Briggs at least has a pretense of having like the conceptual foundation, which kind of and it makes sense. Like astrology makes no sense, but uh, Myers Briggs kind of makes a little bit of sense, and I think that's worse. Right. I think that's what I don't like about Myers Briggs is I'm like, no, your 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 rationality behind this is too rational. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. So have you ever used astrology ever to actually guide you? Like, have you turned to it in times of need? Um. Hmm. I. Uh... <laughs> I don't know if I've like, so it's not like a horoscope. I don't like go to get horoscopes and be like, oh, this week is supposed to be whatever. And I'm not the sort of person who like looks at, um, you know, like, oh, Mercury's in retrograde. That explains why my code isn't building or why the Wi-Fi stopped working. Um, so I don't, I don't turn to it in that way, but I definitely do have a bad habit of like, if I'm, if there's someone that I'm like attracted to or like kind of like have a crush on, I definitely will go look up their horoscope and then try and convince them. <laughs> if I don't know them at all, like I'll just, you know, do it, find whatever I can on the internet. Um, like I know, I, <laughs> I don't know. I know like Richard Feynman, I believe is a Taurus. Uh, Jane Jacobs is also a Taurus. Um, Robert Moses was a Sagittarius. Uh, Jack Dorsey is a Scorpio. Um, okay, you've done this a lot. <laughs> Off the top of your head, you're reeling off the star signs of a bunch of people. Yeah, I think like uh, the guy who wrote The Art of the Motorcycle Maintenance might have been a Pisces, I forget, but yeah. yeah. Robert Piercig, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Elvis uh, Presley was- uh, I think that's actually, what, what was Elvis Presley? He's a Capricorn. Oh, okay. Uh, I think uh, one of the times I've actually seriously used astrology is well, not in terms of um, stalking and looking up people I'm interested in, but more like uh, if I'm sort of feeling stuck and don't kind of have a clear sense of what to do about whatever situation I'm in, one of the most useful things you can do is pull up some sort of arbitrary divination system and look up your profile on that. And usually it's like, you know, seeing yourself reflected in some sort of funhouse mirror, like the, even the parts that fit or don't fit, just the act of like forcing a projection of yourself onto what you read whether it's about yourself in personality terms or whether it's about the period in uh, in terms of what's happening in the situation it's like it's usually enough of an interesting random input that it gets you unstuck so uh, i have used that fairly frequently that, that way of using any kind of divination system uh, that's cool I mean, I've been like drawing a tarot card every Saturday this year. It's like my New Year's resolution. Um, okay. It's not exactly, astro not exactly astrology. What, what was the last one you drew? Oh God, it was so bad this week, Venkat. Oh my God. I drew the, um, I drew the 10 of swords, which okay. I don't know if I have it. I don't have it laying around. Um, it's a, a man laying on his back on the ground with a pool of blood beside him. 
um, and there are ten swords stuck in his back. Um, so it's a very like uh, kind of like death, the end of an era, something like unexpectedly not working out, or like some phase of something that you had been thinking was going to work out suddenly and decisively stops being a thing this week. I think there were more like terrible attributes that were subscribed to this card, which I don't remember. Um, I think the like I decided this week I had decided I was gonna like look through you know you like so the process I usually use is I like shuffle the deck I draw a card I go look up what it means um, and then this week I decided I would take like and usually when you look up what it means there's like a couple different words or descriptions for that thing they're all kind of like in a theme but like it's a little broad so I decided I was gonna like pick a phrase and use that as a um, that phrase was going to be like my theme for the week. Uh, kind of like if you ever go to yoga, they're like, set your intention for your practice today. Mm -hmm. right. um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to like pick a theme. And so the theme I decided to take from this is wisdom from defeat. So, um, Bouncing back from defeat? Oh, wisdom from defeat. Oh, wisdom from defeat. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, so yeah, I, I don't know much about tarot. I just recently had my first ever reading. So uh, my friend Monica, uh, she's on Twitter, but uh, she's from Peru. And she recently came over to the US um, with her husband. They're doing some sort of architecture program in LA here, but I met up with her. But she actually did a tarot reading for me over DMs on Twitter, which was a whole lot of fun. And uh, she has a special thing. She does uh, her tarot readings uh, while on ayahuasca. So. And she's like uh, doing, if she's mixing shaman and tarot readings. So I, I don't quite remember what she said about it, but it was really entertaining. And then I asked her to do a tarot reading for some characters I've been making up for some fiction I'm writing. And that was really fun too. Like um, it, it's, it's amazing how versatile this stuff is. You can apply it to a lot of stuff like um, fictional characters. Uh, yeah, yeah so that's that's just, really, I had never thought to do that. That's really interesting. Thing. Yeah, yeah. You you've been writing a bunch of fiction lately. I know we're jumping past the alphabet A, but uh, yeah, you've been doing fiction and you hate one of your characters, right? And you want to kill her off. I do. But I do <laughs> maybe yeah. you should read her horoscope and figure it out. Oh my God, Ben Cat, that's a terrible idea. I totally should. Maybe that's what like the death card was actually intended for her, not for me. Um, yeah. That like ten of swords is meant for you should do that. Mars. No, Mars is. I, I mean, think of it as just. Uh, as, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mars is the character's name, right? So. Yeah, that's her name. And you want to kill her off, but you, know, you need need her for a few more episodes. She's got one. She's got one final. She's got one final show to show up for. Um, <laughs> uh, which isn't. It's not. I've actually been. I kind of like. I'm doing them weekly, so I kind of am planned. I have like an arc of um so she doesn't show back up for another couple weeks for her last show but uh yeah i'm ready i'm ready for her last show maybe she'll show up later i don't actually know what happens like the back half of the year i don't have that far planned out but um okay yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of arcs and you were talking about tarot and you had a particular sort of theme in mind when you drew the card so uh, from what i understand from tarot practitioners you can do that at like longer Skills, right like you can have a theme for a particular drawing or you can have kind of an entire story you're trying to fill out and um, sort of uh, draw cards to like move along with the story right is that how it works i wouldn't i'm not an expert i wouldn't know exactly um sorry my dog's distracting me um i wouldn't know exactly but um yeah you could, i think you can do that i think a lot of people definitely do have like stories that they try and tell with it um it's the reason I'm asking is that um, I, I think things like astrology, they're partly kind of like uh, world building systems and narrative generation systems. Yeah. So if you use them sort of tastefully and well with the right aesthetic, which is our second topic, uh, if you sort of bring the right aesthetic to using your particular divination system, uh, you can kind of like get interesting results from them. And I think where people set themselves up for disappointment is actually believing in it too much 
but not bringing enough of an aesthetic to it. So you'll get good results if you don't believe in it too much, but bring like a strong aesthetic to it. But you'll get bad, bad results if you believe in it too much, but don't bring any aesthetic to it. In which case you're kind of like desperately just looking for answers, but you're not kind of bringing creativity to the questions. So right. yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. But yeah, aesthetics. Yeah. Well, that's a great transition into our next topic. We should definitely talk about aesthetics because like, I think that I'd like to hear you say more about this, um, what you mean by bringing an aesthetic to a topic. So, yeah, this is a topic where I think I get annoyed by people who think about aesthetics too much because it kind of becomes, uh, uh, okay, let me back up here. Like, when I think aesthetics, I mostly think like um, criticism, like, you know, film critics, art critics, all those kinds of people. And I'm, I always think of the uh, anecdote about Picasso, where he said something like when artists, when critics get together, they talk about theme and mood and structure and stuff. But when artists get together, they talk about where to buy the cheapest turpentine. Yeah. I, I have uh, that attitude towards that attitude of like, skepticism towards uh, people who spitball too much about aesthetics but don't actually create things or do things that require bringing an aesthetic sensibility to it. So the way I describe it to myself is you need an aesthetic about where to get the best turpentine, something like that, right? So it's, it's the yeah aesthetics around actual sort of um, a creative dialectic with your medium, not an aesthetic as in cultivating a taste of consumption. So I, I think that's kind of the central theme in aesthetics for me. Like aesthetics has to be about both creation and consumption. Aesthetics that's purely about consumption is in, at least to me, it's, it's an impoverished beast. Uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. So it's almost like it's a, sounds like you need like a, a participation in the aesthetic culture. Yeah. It's uh, like, uh, let's talk about one of yours, like you're a programmer, right? And I'm purely a consumer of uh, Bitcoin and uh, crypto in the sense of, to, to the extent that I have any aesthetic opinions about the world of crypto, it's like purely from the point of view of like, you know, transacting a little bit, but you program in Bitcoin and I think you've done a bit in Ethereum as well, right? So uh, what, what are your crypto aesthetics? Crypto aesthetics. That's interesting. I mean, I guess I do have like opinions about what crypto projects are worth spending time on, if that's what you mean. Um, uh, so hmm, crypto aesthetics. Uh, yeah, I do. You know, there are. There, OK, this is a good point. Uh, there are certain crypto projects that and maybe this isn't exactly what you meant. Um, but there's definitely crypto projects that I think are like beautiful, if that makes sense. Um, like. Um, I think that Bitcoin is a beautiful system, um, which is why I wanted to work on it. Like, um, just the way that it's like perfectly, like, I don't know, perfect is the exact word, but there's a lot of like balance that's tried to like uh, put into how the system functions, um, which is really clever and interesting and novel and uh, beautiful to see in action and strives to greater ideals of how we as humans want to interact and how, it's not even how we want to interact, but it also, I think, um, to a certain extent, not leverages, but um, exploits the ways that, he, and motivations that humans have, like incentive design. Um, so like it paid a, a very um, sharp and I think uh, intuitive look at how humans are wired to function when value creation is at stake and how value gets handed out in a system and kind of set it up such that all these natural incentives of humans are like balanced in a really nice way. Um, whereas other crypto systems, other crypto, there's other crypto systems that are really crypto systems. Um, I'm not calling them cryptocurrency. So, but yeah, let's pick a specific one. Like, do you, do you, would you say Ethereum is less or more beautiful than Bitcoin or is it beautiful in a different sense? I wouldn't think, I don't think Ethereum is beautiful. This is true. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think it's beautiful. No, it doesn't, it doesn't check those boxes for me. I think it's practical. Uh, I think there's like, 
I think that the community around Ethereum and the people who are looking to leverage Ethereum as a platform to build other interesting things on top of it is beautiful. I think Ethereum has succeeded at getting itself a very beautiful community around it. Um, but I don't think like the underlying project is, it doesn't tickle the same. So, so when, uh, when you say you don't, it doesn't check the boxes for you. Do you mean as a programmer who's kind of looked at the code base and tried to play with it? Like, is it janky at a code level? It's not elegant. Or is it more like uh, mm -hmm. the philosophy behind it? It's more fiat than gold-like. So what, which part of it like doesn't check your boxes? Yeah, so I've done a lot of playing around with Ethereum. A long time ago, before I even got into Bitcoin stuff, a friend and I, my friend Eric and I, attempted to... Um, write an Ethereum contract in this like not very well known language called LLL, um, which was a list based assembly like language for the um, EVM, Ethereum virtual machine. We weren't super yeah. successful, so it's kind of hard to do, um, but it did get me to start reading the yellow paper, which is the original um, Ethereum paper that lays out how the project's gonna work. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, no. So you didn't enjoy that experience, huh? No, not really. Like, it was kind of exciting, and I sort of understood, like, what it was going for, like, a computation engine that's distributed. It's a distributed mm -hmm. computation engine. But no, it didn't really affect me or excite me quite in the same way that learning about, like, the Bitcoin stuff did. Like, the reading the Bitcoin white paper was actually, like, fun and exciting in a way that reading the Ethereum yellow paper just, like, was, like, interesting it was like it was really interesting in that the way that all the stuff had been thought through but it wasn't as well written um personal opinion um yeah i don't know so when you um, make such assessments do you get the sense that you're evaluating both by the same aesthetic standard or do you feel like mm. applying different criteria to Bitcoin and Ethereum and Ethereum is less beautiful by its own natural criteria. Like, is there sort of a vector of perfectibility where an Ethereum-like system could be much better than Ethereum is now versus Bitcoin is kind of like as good as it gets in its world? Is it like that? Or are you actually comparing the two apples to apples, you think? Mm, I don't know if it's a comparison so much as like, I mean, so I think that my aesthetic judgment definitely like um, supersedes necessarily even technology, right? Like I definitely like when I go out and like look at certain works of art, I definitely get the same feeling of like appreciation that I think I feel like when I look at like, not the, I wouldn't say the Bitcoin source code because it's not that gorgeous, but um, like understanding you, uh, give us an example like uh, what's the kind of what's an example of a piece of art that has you know the same energy or aesthetic mood as bitcoin oh man oh the same aesthetic mood as bitcoin okay i'm gonna have to come back is it to like that. renaissance art no yeah, yeah because i'm curious about that i mean to my mind i don't know if i had to map renaissance impressionists uh, uh, modernists surrealists, I don't know where I would, what kind of thing Bitcoin is, but to me, it sounds like it's got a very classical sort of feel to it. So if I had to like pick off the top of my head, I would say Bitcoin is kind of like a Rembrandt and Ethereum is a little bit like Picasso or like, you know, trying to something much more modern and made up. Does that compute, compute for you? Yeah, I think that that actually, I almost would say, hmm, Trying to think, I'm, I'm bad at names, like remembering names of things is not always a strong point. But recently um, I went to the Houston Museum of Fine Arts and they had a really excellent like impressionist era um, kind of display. It was for me, it was like the first time I'd actually gotten like to get this close to Van Gogh. Oh, I would say, okay, I would say the Bitcoin is a lot like Van Gogh. Um, uh, okay, now we're getting somewhere. So Bitcoin is like Van Gogh. Bitcoin and Van Gogh okay. give me the same feeling. Yeah. Because like, oh man, Van Gogh, like I didn't realize how much I liked Van Gogh until I saw some like actual Van Goghs. Wow. Mm -hmm. That guy could freaking paint, man. <laughs> like, like his like old stuff, like his original stuff that's like just, 
he has like the one of the pictures that they had again don't remember the name of it um but it's like a looking out a window so you can see like hills and stuff in the background and there's like a roof line that goes on for a while and you can see like a few other small buildings but he's like clearly like on the second story of a building or maybe like almost like a church um mm -hmm. tower so you can kind of see more out of like a little little city somewhere in paris because yeah. I, I think he was I, Parisian. I think he was anyways um <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think I'm, I remember the one you're talking about, but I don't recall the name either, but I've seen something like it. Okay, well, so in this photo, though, it's so photorealistic. You can, like, it's like, there's like a bird, like a seagull, sitting on or flying in to land on the roof, but it's like super far away. It's like teeny tiny. It's like, like, smaller than like half a fingernail, like super tiny. Mm -hmm. And it's like so incredibly rendered it looks like a real like the whole scene is incredibly just like very photorealistic and then you go to look at some of his other stuff that's not as photorealistic it's more impressionist you know with like the beautiful streaky skies i don't know it was just like clearly a master mm -hmm. with oil starry paint. night yeah a starry night is like beautiful example of his ability to just render these gorgeous scenes you know, that aren't, they don't like, and so the, the cool thing about that is like, he can like nail realism, but he can also nail like this emotional, like outburst of whatever, right? But like, um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, like photorealism, of course, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of like, um, you're not supposed to admit you like photorealism, but I think it's kind of interesting thing that whenever you kind of calibrate and benchmark an aesthetic, the way it relates to realism is probably the most interesting thing about it. Like, uh, do you, have you seen Picasso's sequence of sketches of a bull? Uh, so uh, it, it's a famous uh, panel of like 16 sketches of the same bull. In the top left, it's the bull sort of rendered in a pretty uh, accurate um, sort of photorealistic kind of way. And then it gets sort of um, more and more and more simplified where he's trying to like get at the absolutely essential lines. And by the time you get to the last um, bull, it's like five lines, but you can find, you can see that he's like iteratively figured out the six most high energy important lines that define the bull, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think of it that way and you kind of like see the evolution of the perception process, like he saw the bull the first time, second time. It's like by the 16th sort of pass at looking at the bull, he's kind of distilled his impressionistic essence of the bull. And I think you can see examples of that with uh, a lot of artists in terms of transition across their career. So most artists, I think, start off more photorealistic just to like master their technique and stuff. But then once they've mastered their technique, they start to... Uh, drift from it in a particular direction. So it's almost like the vector in which you drift away from realism defines your aesthetic, right? Uh, so it's like, okay, uh, I'm gonna let that definition hang in the air. I mean, I think that it's interesting to me how much you're echoing one of the first essays I ever wrote about art. Um, the, I think one of the first art galleries I ever went to and spent any amount of time on in my own in on my own was the uh museo de arte sao paulo the maspi so in english the museum of sao paulo museum of art of sao paulo it's like on the main avenue avenida paulista in sao paulo downtown oh is that the one that burned down no. is that the one that burned down a few years no, ago that one was in rio was somewhere else Oh, okay. That was in Rio de Janeiro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually never made it to that. I didn't spend much time in Rio, so I never went to that museum. But um, no, but there was this. Um, so it's, not, it's Sao Paulo, right? Which is like the wealthiest city in Brazil, but it's still in Brazil, which means that they have a lot of trouble getting masters to Brazil. Like, um, you know, New mm -hmm. York City has great masters because all the barons and tycoons from the last, like, industrial revolution bought all this loot and masters and then donated them to a lot of museums in New York, if that makes sense. Like the number of like pieces yeah. that they have is like kind of limited. They have some cool stuff, but not a lot. Anyway, so what they've done is they like gone through all the stuff that they had and put together a, um, put together a, what do you call it? <laughs> Whenever you have a, an exhibit, they had an exhibit. Um, they had a whole exhibit that was okay. <laughs> portraits. 
And it went from mm -hmm. like the 1800s all the way through like modern day. And this is exactly the point that you just made is exactly the thing that I noticed about the progression is it went from like, you know, back before photography was invented, the goal was realism. Mm -hmm. Because realism was the most expensive thing you could buy from art. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so like there's definitely like in all the stuff they talk about how the art would be slightly rendered, you know, because you, you, most of them are commissions. Like the rich person is paying the artist to create a photo of them that they can hang places and pass down through the ages. Yep. Um, and so they talk about how the lack of realism in the photos was always a vanity. Um, the and to, which is to say that they would change the way that they look so that they look better than they might in reality um yeah basically but, what we do in for uh, facebook and instagram now yes right. exactly yeah. yeah but you wanted your image uh, to be as best as possible so but it needed to be like look yeah. like a human right and then the farther you went down portraiture into after i i like my holding in the essays i think that after um photography became a thing all of a sudden realism was way less interesting because um, no longer, it's no longer a game or super valuable to replicate reality because we have a, a tool and a machine that can do that for us in high fidelity very nicely. All of a sudden the interesting thing in art is how you can represent reality is like it started becoming this game of how far away, exactly what you're talking about with Picasso did, how far away can we get from reality and still have reality, right? Um, so uh, I think I would qualify what you're saying with that's one very particular kind of reality, which is instantaneous visual reality, right? And I think the transition away from realism actually predates photography by almost a century, because here's the way I see it, which is if you look, look at Renaissance painting, it's realistic in one sense, in, in the camera sense of the word, it's like people are stiffly sitting for a portrait and it's like very stagey, right? Yeah. Rembrandt and th that era of painting, it's like, it looks very staged. Even things like, I, there's some really famous Rembrandts, like a bun uh, bunch of rich people observing a surgeon performing an operation. Mm -hmm. So the entire thing is laid out as the patient's bodies opened up, the doctor is doing stuff, but everybody's kind of artificially looking at quote unquote, the camera, the artist's eye. And by the time you get to like um, the impressionists, like, you know, Monet and Renoir and others, mm -hmm. you realize that they're still going for realism, but they're not going for realism in the sense of like snapshot realism, but they're looking to capture the essence of a scene. Like, you know, Renoir's uh, famous one of um, a bunch of people dancing at a party in the photo realist sense, it's not realistic because the strokes are very bold and crude and like very rough. But in another sense, in, in the sense of like capturing the movement of the scene, capturing the energy of the scene, it's, it, it, it's going after a different dimension of realism. And I think uh, what the camera did was it kind of distorted sort of um, the space of realism vectors or something like that. So one effect of that was you ended up with like things like Picasso, which are like completely going away from like any representational stuff, but you also have like post photographic artists. Like uh, I saw this uh, exhibit of Andrew Wyatt. Have you seen any of his paintings? I don't think uh, So Andrew Wyatt is uh, I think one of the best modern American painters and he worked I think mainly in tempera, which is the eggshell stuff I think. And all his paintings have this beautiful like extremely light tones like whites and light grays. And most of it is painted um, I think somewhere in Maine or somewhere but it's like boats and the seaside and the same subject painted over and over again across a lifetime. So he's got like one woman who was his neighbor, one black guy who used to work on his farm, but he used to draw them over and over again across like several years. Mm -hmm. And you can see that that's another kind of realism. It's not, it's just not camera type photorealism. So realism, I think what happened after the camera was that the relationship between realism and uh, uh, what's the opposite of Realism, uh, realism uh, and uh, metaphoric or whatever non-realistic style is. It kind of it got altered, right? Yeah. Would you say that surreal, surreal, surrealism is um, the opposite of realism? Is that no, I think surrealism. I would, well, uh, I'm thinking that I, like most people when I think surrealism, I think of uh, Salvador Dali and his clocks hanging off clotheslines kind of thing. So uh, I would say it's not. 
uh, the opposite of realism, but it's kind of like adjacent to realism in the sense of like, you know, paranormal is adjacent to science, something like that. Yeah. So it, it, it's adjacent to it, sort of methodologically. Uh, but, but you have been doing some paintings, right? Have you shared some full paintings on Twitter? Yeah, I've been taking, I started taking my first art classes in 2020. Well, first painting classes in 2020, I should say. Um, yeah, I'm doing... Well, what's your medium, oils? No, I wish. I'm not that bold. I think I'm going to get to oils eventually. I like, I have this habit of like not doing the things I really want to do immediately. I sort of like circle stuff. I tend to do some circles before I get mm -hmm. to where I want to get. Um, so like, I think that oil paintings are definitely, like if the, it's like if I'm going to an art show, the oil paintings are probably going to be the ones that I like feel the most attachment to and just like, oh my God, that looks amazing. Um, but I'm doing acrylic. I took a short class on acrylic because I've done some acrylic painting. Um, it was really short though. And then the more like day-to-day -day weekly thing that I do is a gouache class, which is a um, opaque watercolor sort of esque thing. Oh yeah, I've never used gouache, but uh, yeah, I keep seeing the supplies in art stores. Yeah, when I was a teenager, I took several years of uh, uh, evening art classes. It was mainly watercolor. And I think that's a mistake. Like people try to teach kids, um, like, you know, you graduate from crayons to uh, pencils to watercolor. And that's a bad idea because watercolor is one of the hardest to handle. And I think they do it because it's probably one of the cheapest. The paints are the cheapest to buy. So they start kids off on watercolor. And I wish they'd start them off on a different kind of paint. I 100% agree with you. I tried to learn watercolor and immediately discovered that I absolutely hated so, it. Um, but it's also yeah. like, it's also kind of the easiest to clean up because it's water-based. If you go to acrylic yeah. with kids and it dries, like your paintbrushes are ruined. The supplies are definitely more expensive. Yeah. Watercolor seems the most accessible in terms of cost, but the reality is it's definitely one of the hardest things to paint with. I think personally, like yeah. oil paint, you put the oil on the canvas, you can only work it for like a week. You know, you walk away and come back a week later and fix it or change it because it's still wet, still drying. It takes like... I think yeah. some little paintings take, are still drying. You know, the ones hanging in the museum are, like, still drying. Um, <laughs> yeah. Whereas, like, watercolor, the instant that yeah, you I think touches it's... paper, your paper is stained. It stains the paper. <laughs> you can, like, yeah. take a paintbrush and dab it up and, like, pull it back out of the paper. It's gone. It's over. It's, like, done. So watercolors take a lot of planning. Um, you know I mean? Yeah. Oh. That reminds me of another A, which is uh, ASMR. Have you ever watched Bob Ross videos? Bob Ross was watercolors, right? I don't know. I thought he was like acrylic or oil. I don't remember. Actually, yeah, he might. I'm pretty sure he used like pellet mm -hmm. knives, which would probably be oil, if I had to guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. He, yeah, yeah, oil. Now I remember. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, ASMR. ASMR, I think, is kind of a process aesthetic, right? While you're making art, does it calm you? Is it like folding laundry? Is it like high energy? I, I think painting used to stress me out. That's why I stopped doing it. It did not oh. relax me. Yeah, no, it's not relaxing. The lady and I in my class, she's like retired, and she said she was telling her friend she's taking this art class, and they were like, oh, isn't that the most relaxing thing? And she's like, no, actually, it's quite stressful. Like, <laughs> we get in this class, and we have three hours, and like, he's like, here is some glass and some folded fabric, and you have three hours, ready, set, get this done. And you're like, oh, my God, like, paint, draw, get it on there. Like, no, it's not, it's not relaxing. I find it, I also find it kind of stressful. Um, yeah, no, it's not relaxing. Yeah. I mean, the music they play when we're doing is sort of relaxing, but that's like the background. That's definitely not the process. Maybe other people find it relaxed. Maybe it becomes more relaxing the more you do it. I think it becomes relaxing if you do it on your own without like a teacher or somebody trying to like judge your quality of it. Yeah. And it becomes relaxing if you can, if you feel comfortable wasting your material. I think I'm very Puritan in that sense. I don't like wasting materials. So I think my favorite kind of drawing always has been like, you know, doodling in the margins of books or actually one of the things I used to do as a kid was, I grew up in this house with um, our dining room had a kind of like almost chalkboard like red floor. Mm -hmm. And it was very easy to with chalk. So sometimes my dad would bring home chalk from work 
and I would just cover the entire floor of the dining room with um, chalk doodles, and then it, it could just get mopped up. So I think you need something like that, like, you know, the back sides of printer paper or margins of textbooks you kind of hate. It's like a way of getting revenge on your chemistry textbook or something. You know? <laughs> but uh, that's the only time I found art relaxing is when I'm doing it sort of without wasting material and without somebody breathing down my neck. I feel like I'm hearing you say that the only time you find art relaxing is when you're doing it for revenge. Um, <laughs> no, no, which definitely is pretty- not revenge. I, I just threw that out there and I'm not that Scorpio. Uh, that's a Scorpio trait. That's like, a very Scorpio revenge. trait. Yeah, but I'm not actually at all revengeful. Like I get pissed off at people and I sort of uh, sulk for a while, but then if I don't like them, I just drop them and move off. I'd never feel revengeful instincts. Mm. Um, uh, but yeah, I just uh, threw that out there as a possible motivation for other people. Like I doodled in my chemistry textbook, even though I really loved chemistry as well. It's like, yeah, I can like a subject and desecrate its textbook. So that doesn't bother me. And you're like an equal opportunity doodler, sort of. Yeah, Your textbook uh, absolutely. Doodler. Yeah, I think we should, I, well, I think we should maybe wrap it there, uh, Venkat. This is a great first conversation. Absolutely, and we should put D for do somewhere down the line all Dude, right that sounds yeah. great yeah cool maybe should we talk a little bit about um the format for our scorpio season stuff just so people have a good idea about maybe how we're structuring what we're talking about um yeah why don't you explain it yeah great so uh, you're gonna have to help me out with the part about the reference to hitchhiker's guide for the galaxy but um oh, okay yeah yeah <laughs> but the the general idea is that we're um we have a list of topics they run from A to Z. We started with A's. So today we are talking about astrology and aesthetics. And then um, should I preview what we're going to talk about next time, Venkat? Um, we kind of like almost started going into it this time, right? Bitcoin, I think, was on the list for B. So we already got into that. We can get more into that next time. Into it. It'll be, you know, I think these are more themes that will come up. Um, so next time are the B's. We've got beefs, Bitcoin, and Brazil which I think we've previewed almost all of these now. Um, Beefs, I don't think we have, but Brazil and Bitcoin, we did. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it depends on whether that or not you like count your aggression beef. towards your textbook as a beef um, or not. <laughs> well, my fake aggression. I love my textbooks. <laughs> <sighs> all right. Great. Well, it was a great chatting with you, uh, Venkat. Okay, yeah. And uh, cool. All right, listeners, look forward to having you on for next Scorpio season. Uh, Scorpio season runs from November to November, so tune in. November to November. (laughs) Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, We're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Great. Um, And if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.